perfect. I'm and Liz. Looking at you, right? Not that, right? Yeah. And Liz, we're in. Oh. Hi. No, it's okay. I never know how to start these things, so you might as well just kind of jump in like mid-sentence because then it doesn't have to be like some big thing. Okay. Sounds good. So thank you so much for uh, coming in today to the studio. And um, yeah, how's your summer been? It's been really good. Yeah. been in New York, and I'm one of the rare people that loves the New York heat. So I really, I enjoyed it. That uh, sticky, humid East Coast summer? Love it. Like, I could live on the equator. Like, my favorite city that I ever visited for the weather was probably Bangkok. So that says a lot. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Southeast Asia is uh, cooking in the summer, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Not bad. Not bad. Well, I grew up in Toronto, Canada, so we were quite close to New York, and I do remember those hot, sticky summers and those crazy thunderstorms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are the thunderstorms, but I find those too much. I still like being cold. And by cold, I mean even like 60 degrees, and I'm like, oh, my God, I need my coat and hat. And yeah. It's a little nicer out here, though, isn't it? It is, yeah. So I spend a few months here every year. That's good. Yeah. Um, I've lived here now for like a year and I think it's rained four times and it's sunny every day. That's why I come out January, February, March in general. I, mean, I mix it up a little bit every year depending on work stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah. so um, so today we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you have your own podcast. We'll get into that. Uh, we'll get into the topics that you cover and some of the people you get to meet and we'll kind of delve into that. But I'd love to go back a little bit further. So where are you originally from? I grew up in New York. Okay. So. Born and bred New Yorker. I've lived some other places. I went to school in Austin, lived in London. I've lived in Paris and traveled around some. And as I said, partially in LA now, but born and bred New Yorker. I always seem to end up back there. New York's a special place though. You have to admit like there's no other city like that in the world. The 24 hours, I prefer public transportation to driving. There's always so much to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I really love all of that. Yeah, the the shitty thing about being out here is you really do need a car if you're going to pop around and, like, actually meet people. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I stay in Santa Monica when I'm here, and that's a little better. Like, it, there's a lot that's walkable, you know, going to gym classes on the bus, going to, like, farmer's market or co-op is busable or walkable. But, yeah, I mean... If you want to have friends in other neighborhoods, you know, you have to either have a car or take a lot of Ubers. The The ongoing joke here in L.A. is that uh, if you have a podcast guest in Santa Monica and they have to cross the 405 to get into Beverly Hills or West Hollywood or wherever, like, that is a real ask. I, I took you up on it. <laughs> I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful. So, um, So what did you study in school which got you into having some curiosities about the afterlife, right? Because I think that's going to be part of our topic for today. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Oh, my God. Nothing in school. If you'd asked me back then, I, I said communications, and I, it never crossed my mind as something I would have ever considered. Like, I mean, I just thought this stuff was weird. And just, it wasn't even like I made a point of thinking it was weird. It was just completely not on my radar. And it was never something I would have thought was possible. Like, the only versions of an afterlife I'd heard about were through organized religion, which made no sense to me. And I grew up in a very secular culture. So with that perspective of it, you know, I mean, it was terrifying and miserable and depressing. And who wants to think about it? So I just avoided as much thought of it. It's funny that when we grow up, we get introduced to life and death through organized religion, which are obviously important for a lot of people in the world, but also have very little realism in scientific knowledge in any way, shape, or form. And it's funny that we're introduced to that first, and then later we figure out what science is doing. And then even then, it, there's still way too many questions to be answered. <laughs> very true, very true. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Catholic. I grew up in a Catholic family. I went to Catholic schools for the earlier stages in my life before I went to secular schools. But then after you go to secular schools and you go to university, you know, you take some science classes, some biology classes, some physics classes, you know, and then you start traveling the world and you start understanding, like, how many organized religions are there and how many different versions of death and birth and renewal and, you know, do we have? And then it's like, what makes sense? What's real? What do we, what, do, what can we put our finger on and be like, that's the one I believe. I find it so confusing. Yeah, I mean, I grew up, half Jewish, half Protestant in a more Jewish culture. But like to me, 
neither of those were about relig. Ooh, you okay? <laughs> yeah. I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. I just whacked my teeth <laughs> with my bottle if anyone was watching. Mm. Neither of those really were about like God or religion to me. They were culture and holidays. Again, more, I'd say Jewish culture was a lot more of my culture, but you know, both of those were about holidays. Like if you asked me what Easter was about as a kid, it was the Easter bunny. Mm. You know, we, you know, Christmas was Santa Claus. And then on the Jewish holidays, we'd say the prayers, but in Hebrew and I didn't know what any of them meant. It was really about like Hanukkah's eight presents. So it was just never, God was just an absolutely not even on the radar in my culture, you know, secular New York. So. And, and when did you start taking an interest in like what happens after we die? So unfortunately in 2015, my dad passed away. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, so I was kind of, I guess you could say forced into caring. And when he went into hospice, you know, my very first thought was, well, you know, is there any possible way to turn back time? And I consider myself a logical person. So I didn't, you know, wasn't one of those people that thought I could go into my room and build a time machine. But, you know, you're kind of in that like hazy, unable to think, not sleeping, running in and out of hospitals. Like I moved in with my mom to deal with it. It was just, you know, it's incredibly hard. And, you know, when we realized the doctors basically said there were no hope is when I started to think about time. And I just wondered, could time travel be possible? So I Googled that and I started reading about Einstein's theories of time relativity. And the crazy thing is, yes, time travel is possible. Theoretically, it's not practical. But so there's the Einstein twin experiment. That's one of the things that really had an impact on me. And that was if you were to build a rocket ship that traveled at close to the speed of light and you had two twins and one stayed on Earth and the other traveled for, let's say, five years. I'm going to have the numbers wrong, but the concept right. Let's say one twin traveled for like, yeah, as I said, five years. Five years would have passed for them, 20 years for the twin on Earth. And I'm just like, shit. And, you know, if that is true, that means that one of the most factual, just non-questioning, uh, in unchangeable things of our experience is really different than how we experience it. So what else? And then my very next thought was about reincarnation. And at that time, without a doubt, I assumed consciousness, as neuroscientists say, our consciousness and human experiences are created by a brain. So my thoughts were, you know, we have our brain firing neurons that create us, created me, created my dad. And when you think of reincarnation, it's one, you know, person or one, you know, consciousness getting to live as many different people. So I thought if you actually think about the concept of eternity, eternal big bangs and eternal big crunches, the amount of Goldilocks planets out there that will sustain intelligent life form over the concept of eternity, there will be other evolutions that create another person or highly intelligent being depending on the evolution that I would get to be my dad would get to be I wouldn't remember me he wouldn't remember being him but that's certainly better than eternal obliteration and that seems pretty almost definite if you think of eternity so I then had like the next thought if that is true is there any way in some way that I can't understand some memories carried over I googled that and that's when everything changed Mm -hmm. everything so those are those are big questions <laughs> yeah the big ones right yeah like are we alone in this universe you know how many dimensions do we live in and or can we see versus how many actually exist like um it's it's really confusing and i also think too like in some ways the answers to these questions are hugely destabilizing to the fragile psyche that we've all created for ourselves about who we are, where we've come from, and and what we believe in. And I feel like like if there was life after death, or if there was some proof of reincarnation, or any of these things, like our entire organized religion and political setup would just crumble. I suppose so. Yeah. But it, it's there actually is 
evidence of all of this, strong evidence, maybe even close to proof. And maybe all of that would crumble, but also, I mean, for me, it like transformed my world and like all my world tumbled down, but in the best way. I mean, really, who wants to die? You know, who wants to have their consciousness permanently wiped out? I don't. And I never thought there was another option. So, you know, you bring up the proof of reincarnation. I can't call it proof that it's evidence. Um, this was the first thing I found with my Google search. Doctors Jim Tucker and his um, mentor, Dr. Ian Stevenson. Ian Stevenson's passed away and Dr. Tucker's taken over the research and the practice. They are child psychiatrists, professors at the University of Virginia of Psychiatry, and they study cases of kids with past life memories from an evidence-based approach. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've heard about this. This is where like kids under five remember things from like their previous life experience that like they could never possibly have, uh, have reconciled as a five-year-old. There are things that happened to a 30-year-old. 40 year olds, 50 year olds in a totally different life. I've read a little bit about this. It's shit. Not only is it not reconcilable to what they would understand at that age, Dr. Stevenson and Dr. Tucker traced to figure out who they were talking about. And in some of the cases, they call them the solved cases. They found the families of who they were talking about. That's it's crazy. Insane. Mm -hmm. And the strongest case is, um, have you heard of the um, James Leininger case? No, I haven't heard of that one. So this is actually the case that apparently convinced Jim Tucker. I mean, I can't say for sure he's 100% convinced, but at least pretty much convinced him. He'd have to speak for himself about to what extent. And this was a little boy. He was, you know, started as, I don't know, probably one year old having nightmares where he would wake up screaming, plane on fire, little man go down. And he kept drawing plane crashes. Jesus. Crazy. Yeah. I know. Poor little kid and poor parents. Yeah. And the parents also took him one day to a, um, I guess, an airplane museum of old airplanes. And he... That he saw, he recognized some World War II fighter jets and he made corrections. He said one thing was incorrect in the museum that no one would know. And they Googled and found out it was true. Dr. Jim Tucker came and took the case and studied it. And, you know, very long, very in depth story short, he found out who James Leininger was having memories of being. And it was a young man who had died as a World War II fighter pilot in a plane crash. And I mean, one of the remarkable things that happened was James Leininger, the little boy, had these dolls, these like army dolls. And let's say one had black hair, one red hair, and one blonde hair. He gave them each a name and found out later. So, you know, to move forward then, he ended up meeting with men who had been in the Air Force with this James who died. And now they were elderly man who was a little boy. They shared memories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were white haired and bald. And he found out that the men whose hair color had corresponded with the doll's names were men who'd been in the Air, Air Force with him with mm -hmm. that hair color. And he met his sister, now an elderly woman. And there are a few other cases that strong. It's rare for a case to be that strong, but when is this like, when are these, I, I mean, it's again, like the science is there. Like you have these therapists doing this work with children. Like when is this going to become like maybe not such a fringe movement? That is the question. Mm. I wonder that all the time. I mean, the, let's see, this case was in Surviving Death, which was a Netflix series. And it was based on a book written by Leslie Kane, who's a New York Times journalist who also researches all of this or she research researches a lot of the researchers she's not herself in a lab and dr jim tucker's written books dr ian stevenson's written books i for the life of me cannot understand how this has not gone more mainstream maybe it's organized religion kind of keeping it down maybe yeah it's wild because um 
because you know like I, I grew up in China so I spent a lot of years living in China 18 spent a lot of time like trekking and climbing in Tibet and obviously they believe in reincarnation right so their entire religious belief is that uh you know based on your current life you get either you know a better life next time or a worse life next time depending if how you behave um a little bit similar to to you know western religions but also but a little different as well but um but again like apart from these kind of fringe experiences uh in the eastern world and a few people literally like maybe just a handful of doctors doing the research of this in the united states like not enough people are really embracing this. Do you think it's just because there's too many people who believe in organized religion? I have no idea. This is what I ask everyone. Yeah. Why Why is this not more mainstream? It's a huge question. Huge question. I mean, I can speculate. Maybe it's partially organized religion. And I don't mean this to sound disrespectful in any way, but the, there's sort of a lot of people take a sort of weird approach to this when they talk about it rather than a science-based approach or maybe to use a less rude word like a more sort of belief spiritual based approach you know talking about it without asking for evidence or you know you hear stories where someone's like oh i was you know this celebrity in my past life or you know it's you don't hear very often about the rational approach and then I think therefore it has a stigma attached to it and I think that stigma is really hard to overcome I can't begin to understand why I mean when I found out about Dr. Jim Tucker he's even been on NPR I mean I think the New York Times I'd have to double check I believe they've quoted him or written a little bit about him sure. it's just so I don't understand how when this is addressed it's not having massive impact yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you have to think it has something to do with control, right? Like, can you imagine if like 8 billion people one day just woke up and simultaneously didn't fear death? Yeah, I, uh, that would be amazing. It would be. Possibly, maybe, maybe we both behave horribly, I don't know. Yeah, like how would people behave if they no longer feared death? Like, what would you eat? Like, what would you, would you, would you want to sleep? Would you even want to work? Would you care about health care and insurance? Like if you knew that you were going to get reincarnated someday? I now no longer pretty much fear death, not in a logical way, but I still have that instinctive, like I still get anxiety if I think about dying. I still want to go get, take care of myself medically. Mm -hmm. You know, there still is that biological survival instinct. Plus I like this life. I mean, it's sort of like if you're on a trip and you're having a great time and you know afterwards you're going to go somewhere else you like. Are you just going to say, fuck it, I don't care about this trip at all? Like, I don't care about this part of my life at all? You know, so I think it's, at least for me, similar to that. It just, this miserable dread has gone away in regards to death. Mm -hmm. But I still value this life because I feel like I care about myself as Liz. I care about my life. I care about my loved ones. I have a lot I still want to accomplish, both personally and professionally, it's yeah, it's it's strange. Like imagine, imagine you just woke up every day and you didn't fear anything, and you what, what would you do differently? Anything? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I, I. You know what? I can't wrap my mind around about around that question. Would it be just this very powerful go for it with my dreams, or would I just be an idiot like having during like? during a pandemic running around outside with no mask and going to parties, you know, or would I just be like, I'm going to go so fearlessly for my dreams. And if I die doing it, who cares, you know, or run out of all money or, you know, am I going to go skydiving or, you know, I don't know which it would be if just fear was completely. Alert. It's right. Like, like saving money and preparing your whole life for your eventual demise wouldn't, wouldn't, you wouldn't do it. You'd just live and then you'd get to live again. Like it, it's wild. Like it upends every single thing that we think to be, to hold sacred would be totally flipped on its head. Except like if you know you're coming back here, would you want to make this place a complete cesspool? You know, I mean, you want to have a nice life. I mean, you still want to enjoy it. I would we come back to this same life in the same dimension on the same planet? Like that's, you know, that's another question. Like, or would we come back as an animal? Like 
you know, in some Eastern religions, you know, sometimes you come back, you don't always come back in human form, right? Um, sometimes you would come back as a, as an animal. Like the, I think, um, in Tibetan religion, I think there's a, there's a, a belief that, um, like mothers that pass on, come back as worms. So when you see worms in the ground or you're doing construction and you see worms and stuff like that, you're supposed to treat them with, with uh, as if they were your mother. So you treat them incredibly with respect and things like that. Cause that'll, that'll depend on, you know, how good your afterlife is or something like this. I mean, I would kind of love if we treated all animals that way, yeah. but I, I mean, if the evidence directly shows that we come here as humans, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised at all if we come as animals and I mean, this planet's not going to go on forever. So if our consciousness continues, we're going to have to go on on other planets. Mm. I would be surprised if we don't even now. You know, I mean, there's I, I consider it almost impossible. There isn't intelligent life on other planets and way out the masses. NASA is discovering now in deep space of planets that look sustainable to life. And I mean, I don't even have the quotes and numbers. It was just astronomical, the amount of galaxies they're finding and solar systems. Like, to think that we are the only planet with life seems, you know, kind of, I guess it's very much part of, like, human nature, but it's, very, I, to me, very comparable of people, who, you know, like, a thousand years ago who lived in a little island and thought the end of the island was the end of the earth, and that's all there was. Yeah. Feels like that, doesn't it? It feels like, it kind of feels like we're on the verge, like, of the next 10 or 20 years where we're going to figure out, like, we don't actually die and our consciousness exists, you know, and then... There's people who live on other planets, and they're not that far away. And and then, you know, and then, I don't know, I just feel like everything about, I feel like interplanetary travel is going to change absolutely everything about everything we've believed to be true thus far. I think so, too. Yeah. yeah. And I hope it happens in our lifetime. I mean, real interplanetary travel where we meet other beings in our year, doing robots on Mars. I don't think it's going to be that long till humans go to Mars. Mm -hmm. They're already discussing the Mars colonies, though. Who knows? But in terms of meeting other beings, it's possible it happens in our lifetime. It wouldn't shock me. I mean, it wouldn't shock me if it was in our recent lifetime, you know, probably later in our lifetime. Mm. It's interesting how many people have gotten into this space after losing a loved one. Like, you know, you lost your, your father in, in 2015, and I've chatted with a few other people in this space as well. They've lost wives and and husbands and children in some tragic um, accidents, you know. And they've and they've got and they've really believed that their consciousness is kind of still with them, um, and even to the point where like they've, you know, had conversations or or felt their presence when they're talking about them and things like that. Like, and then they've got these people who are like mediums who who are actually like a bridge between these these two spaces, and then. You know, it's just, there's so much to read. There's so many different interpretations of the way things play out. Like, how have you, in the last almost, but almost 10 years now, like, how have you kind of positioned your understanding of how all of this works? What, I mean, what are, what are your kind of beliefs on your own experiences? Well, so, yeah, I've also really delved in deeply to mediums. I've learned a lot about near-death experiences and a bunch of the other research. What, first of all, I don't like the word belief because I think with it kind of comes an assessment without evidence. So I would say, what do I think is most likely? I mean, I can't really explain the mechanism of how it works. If I did, I'd be sitting with my Nobel Prize. <laughs> but I, if I could guess, it makes most sense to me now when I put all the evidence together that our consciousness is downloaded by a brain. It's stored in some type of cloud-like experience, probably interacts with other dimensions. I mean, string theory already comments or has discovered other dimensions. And some way where it hopefully eternally or at least significantly, significantly longer than this life continues in a form of personality and consciousness and has experiences that are physical and non-physical and other dimensions. And, you know, another reason, thing that I thought about, along with all the evidence I've researched, such as mediums, is also what comes down to what's called the hard problem of consciousness. Do you know that quote? Okay, so I believe Stephen Chalmers um, coined the phrase, the hard problem of consciousness. And it's just that we 
don't understand consciousness anyway, I realized that before even thinking about this stuff, I just assumed we understood consciousness was created by a brain. But when you start to think about that, that is just as weird, like a, you could even use the word woo type of explanation. It just makes no sense either. And I mean, in a way, consciousness doesn't make sense. But when you think of these cells of our brains, mass and matter that are completely unconscious, unconscious themselves, somehow come together and fire in just the right way to create the way our consciousness is, which goes so much more beyond, you know, surviving. You know, if we were living like how, I guess, how we believe amoebas live, you know, where it's just about eating, surviving, and reproducing, that would make a lot more sense as created by a brain. But we get into love and complexity and personality and just our consciousness is so complex it makes no sense to say it's created by a brain and it makes no sense to say it's non-physical and downloaded by a brain and one isn't weirder than the other so mm -hmm. that's what i've it's funny how much um like money goes into research for like vaccines for example yeah. or for interplanetary travel yeah and how like no one is like spending enough time trying to figure out what the fuck is going on in our own heads I agree. I mean, don't get me wrong. I am thrilled that there are that much money in vaccines. Otherwise, we would not be sitting here in person. I would not be getting on Zoom and interplanetary travel. Fantastic. But yeah, I think the other, it, it should be equally considered. And I think this research that's already getting just absolutely inexplicable data that our consciousness doesn't work the way we think, I, I don't know how it's not getting. Mm-hmm. I mean, have you, you know, do you believe in, in like dreams being able to show us like other levels of consciousness as well? Like, are you, are you big on, on that? I'm big on it, but I definitely think so. I mean, I can mention a book and I can mention like kind of a personal experience. I've had quite a few with them. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a book and it's hundred years old already. It's, um, called an experiment with time and it's by J.W. Dunn and, can't remember exactly what he did but he was like this very rational man he was like i want to say an electrical engineer mm -hmm. and he began to notice and wrote a book of his dreams that when he recorded his dreams he would predict the future and you know the thing with this predicting the future is it isn't this astronomical predictions and it just seems to be the way time and consciousness works and I noticed when I was writing down my dreams, I would have the same things. I mean, I wish I was dreaming up lottery numbers. It wasn't that amazing, but it was little things. I mean, really like pointless, aside from that it shows that time seems to work differently or dreams. Like one dream I dreamt I was going to this one gym class I always went to at a little studio. And I dreamt basically very similar to the outdoors there and that they were giving us four different, they, or that they had a juice machine and we could get one of four juices. The next day I went to that class and they were giving out juice samples outside in an area that was similar to the dream and there were four options. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's absolutely, I, that doesn't benefit my life in any way to get information like that. But maybe if you keep training that, and you start getting more powerful information. I once had a dream. I was going to an appointment the next day, um, like, and I had a exact dream uh, that I was, you know, that the woman it was like a body work appointment, and in the dream, I dreamt she was running late and asked me to wait in this waiting room, and it was very visually specific, and it was pretty mundane. Just she's like, "I'm twenty minutes late. Do you mind waiting?" Sure. And then I was just out of curiosity. I'm like, this is weird. Can I tell you my dream? And I described the place and it was identical to one of her family country homes. And so I'm like, who knows? What does this mean? Yeah. It's, it, seems like, it seems like for most people who do have dreams that eventually come true, like it happens to a lot of us, but we don't know how to, we don't know how to interpret it or we don't know how to train our brains or we don't know how to like hone this skill in any way shape or form like it would be bizarre not to think there's not like you know a group of like 50 people or somewhere in the united states who are like actually training their brains on how to see into the future or how to kind of master 
you know, these kind of random events that happen in kind of all of our lives. Like we've all had some moment where we saw something in the future and it kind of came true. I'm sure everyone listening has had that, you know, happen, but, but to do it again and again, to do it more specifically, to, to, to train, like, it seems like we should all be doing this in some way, shape or form. I agree. I think there are groups studying this, you know, and it's to what extent, how seriously is it being done? What are the goals? How skilled are they? I mean, you've heard of the Stargate remote viewing, right? No, what's this? In the 19, it, it was declassified in the 1990s. And there was a group of, um, and I hope, uh, forgive me if I get any of the details wrong, but essentially the CIA had a group of remote viewers um, through the military. And that was people who were able to go view this you know, places in the distance, out of body, you know, getting information. They would just be given the coordinates, and a lot was verified. One of the people who initially coined the phrase remote viewing and taught the skills to people for how to do it was Ingo Swan, and he would go and look at other planets, and he found rings. He went out of body and found rings around Jupiter before they knew there were rings, and he you know, came back and they were just assumed and he probably kind of agreed with them as far as I know and was like, oh, this is what I saw. And they were like, well, that's fantasy. And then I guess about 10 years later, you know, as telescopes got better, what he saw was verified. Mm -hmm. And then there were like, you know, weird time things with this too. You know, this man, Russell Targ, was part of the program and he went and viewed a building. He sketched out what he saw and he saw... Um, I believe he sketched out either a pool or water towers, and it was wrong. Ten years later, what he sketched out was built in that location. And it wasn't like this was a known thing where people were like, oh, okay, we saw this. Let's copy what he did. It was completely unknown. Mm -hmm. And then So he was able to see the future. Able to see the future with it. And some aren't. Some are seeing what's going on right now. And the um, I believe... In the 60s, 70s, I'm going to have the dates wrong, but it was um, it was declassified in the 90s. The government was doing this to spy on the Soviet, and they found a lot of accurate information. That just was remarkable. And these were like military, at the time, primarily men, and what they were getting was verified. And these were not like, you know, what would be considered for lack of a better word, woo people. Mm -hmm. And these were declassified. And when you see some of the sketches and what they match up with what was going on, it's just, I mean, it's not explicable by what we understand. No. Well, do, you, do you see like psychedelics and drug use playing a role in kind of like kind of achieving vision in a third dim in another dimension or, or understanding, you know, your dreams in a deeper way? Like, do you see that as being like a helpful process? I've heard it is. I haven't researched it yet, and I haven't tried it. I am like, so wimpy about that stuff. I'm like, I'm going to be the one person who dies on this out of like a billion, or I'm going to be the one person that ends up with like permanent brain damage. I mean, I don't think from what I've heard that doesn't really happen, but I just, I want to have done it. And every time I actually think about going and doing it, I'm way too scared. But I do think from what I've heard that, it does seem to play a big role. I just haven't researched it enough to really have anything val valid to say, mm. except that it does seem when you alter your brain. I can talk about some more experiments I heard about, like weird things, like verifiable weird things happen, not just like hallucinations. Yeah. Yeah. This is the town for that. I know a few like ayahuasca people here that do the whole psychedelic thing and yeah, it can be pretty powerful for people who are going through something or who are looking for some deeper meaning or some some looking for some grand change or something like that. It can help kind of them figure out, you know, which path to take. It can be quite uh, quite powerful, but I haven't really heard of it being useful for like communicating with people from the past or the future or kind of having a a deeper understanding of of how that works. It's more of like an internal deep dive. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I know some people with ayahuasca too, and I, I'm fascinated. And 
I never decide I'm not too scared. Maybe I'll try it and see what happens. So, so what have your own experiences been like in, in this? Like, you know, you've, you've, you've had some dreams, you've seen some things. I mean, have you been able to communicate at all with people who have left our, our consciousness? Has that been part of your experience? A tiny bit. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And it absolutely blew me away because I do not consider myself someone who can do that. So I can go, I guess, into how I got into that with mediumship. So early in my research, again, after finding Dr. Jim Tucker through the University of Virginia, you know, once you find one of them in that world, you find all of them. So through the division, it, and that department's called the Division of Perceptual Studies, and they have other people there who research psychic mediums. And then I found another group called the Winbridge Institute, and they conduct up to quintuple blinded studies on psychic mediums. And I was like, that's crazy. So like huddled up in like my deep grief and depression, I'm reading all the books on these studies. And I'm like, this is crazy. I've got to get a reading myself. So I end up getting my first medium reading. And I take protocols like fake name, hidden identity, like hide everything. And this woman knew things she absolutely could not have known. And after that, I was like, you know, I mean, you've seen it's so out of the realm of how, like, what's possible versus impossible that it's not like I walked away and the next day I was like, oh, okay, she did all this. I was like, what was the catch? And that was part of what's led to this intense journey because then I had to get another reading and another reading. And they were varying degrees of, you know, believable versus not. And in all this researching mediums, I discovered the Forever Family Foundation. I know you had one of the co-founders, Bob Ginsburg, on. Mm. And he founded it with his wife, Fran Ginsburg. And so long story short, I reach out to volunteer for them because they are an organization that work with people on, you know, handling grief retreats and helping heal grief. And they also certify psychic me mediums using science-based testing. So I'm like, I've got to see what's going on behind the scenes. Like I still... After, you know, at this point, it's been about a year, I've had multiple medium readings. I still think there's a good possibility I'm missing the catch, and I've got to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So after I start volunteering, I'm running their social media at this point, and then this is my first time meeting them in person. I go to one of their conventions in 2016 called the Afterlife and Mediumship Convention, and a group of their mediums are there, and they're holding workshops at some of the researchers. And I'm like, wait, these people are normal. That was one of the things. And I end up, you know, this my first time meeting Fran and Bob in person. And sadly, Fran's passed away in 2020. But the two of them basically became like adopted parents to me. And I, so this is my personal experience getting information. So on the last night, they held a dinner where guests, because for this convention, there were different tracks you could be on. You could be there because you were in grief and lost someone, which is what I did. Or you wanted to be a medium yourself and you were at varying levels of capability. And so I did, um, so I was obviously doing the grief one, but the last night they had a dinner where guests could, develop, could demonstrate their mediumship abilities so very jokingly, Bob Ginsburg was like, Liz, why don't you get up and go give readings? And I was laughing. I'm like, of course not. Then I was like, wait, I'm going to get up and do a cold reading as a joke. Now, cold reading is what, you know, people who don't believe at all in mediumship thinks all mediums are doing. And some do do it either deceptively or, um, you know, for performance, not deceptively. That would be, you know, at a party for fun. And it's when it's basically cheating. It's, you know, like when a medium will look at you and assess you and be like, oh, you probably have like a grandmother who's passed away. And so I had taken a class at this place called the Rhine Research Center, Rhine Education Center. And it was taught by a parapsychologist, someone who researches, you know, psi and, you know, afterlife evidence and, you know, for lack of a better word, ghosts, you know, parapsycho parapsychological phenomena. Lloyd Arbach, he's also a stage magician, so he knows how things are fake. And I'd taken a class with him on psychics and mediums, 
and he, we also learned a bit about cold reading. Not to cheat and not to do it, but just so we're aware and can know the difference. So I said, well, uh, you know, let me go do a cold reading. I'll do what I learned at Lloyd's. So I go up to do it, and you were, the assignment was to read. Yeah, you know, there were 12 mediums sitting on a panel, and you would give them a reading, and they would give you feedback. And I went up to one. At this point, it was the only one I knew. And she'd written a book, so I knew a few things from her book. I just thought I was being funny. I was saying a few things from her book. And I started to feel really weird. Like, I can't quite explain it. I felt kind of, like, light and dizzy and, like, couldn't really think, which sounds like it would be uncomfortable freezing like that in front of a bunch of people. It wasn't at all. Mm -hmm. And I can't really say how long I stood there. It could have been, like, two seconds. It could have been two hours. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't two hours because they wouldn't have let me do that. But from my sense of perception, I can't explain why I walked over to this other medium who I didn't know at all. And I just started to see things. But like based on these sensations I was feeling, I started feeling these waves move through my body and move. And then they stopped and they all congealed in one spot in my chest and started to burst and congealed and burst and built up and burst about like five times. I was like, did someone die of a heart attack? And I explained what I was feeling. And he said, yes. Then they moved to a spot in my head and just all went to this one spot, built up there and burst. And they kept doing that. I was like, someone die of a brain tumor? I was like, wait, no, it's like bursting. Was it an aneurysm? He said, yes. And so... That was just so weird. And I mean, that's not specific enough information to be a really good medium, but that certainly showed me what was going on and helped me believe them at another level and understand how they were giving information. And it was one of the most like remarkable, weird, transformative experiences of my life. Mm -hmm. so. Do you think do you think that people have to go through some kind of significant loss in their life of a loved one to be able to have the the kind of um um, what, what, what am I, what am I looking for? The kind of sensitivity to be able to feel some of these feelings that people might be able to, to pick up if you were a medium or, you know, like, I just feel like, like why, I don't know, like, why aren't more people talking about this or why aren't more people like sharing these experiences? I have no idea why more aren't sharing. Yeah. I mean, I think to be a medium, no, you don't need to have gone through this. I think there's people that seem to be born with some abilities and, you know, they talk about having visions since they were children and they have to learn to turn them off. I think for someone who's maybe not as innately a medium like me, and I don't have these experiences like that 99% of the time, you know, it wasn't, this isn't typical. It's not like now I can suddenly sit and give people readings. Ah, you know, I, I you probably don't have to have a loss. You have to be very motivated to do this and I think most people who aren't otherwise kind of part of this world maybe already having abilities that they've known since they were a kid they just wouldn't be drawn to it necessarily unless they had a loss and yeah. I'm sure there's other reasons maybe they faced a terminal diagnosis and then you know that they healed from you know I think you have to I mean everyone has their own reason but I think the majority of people just why would you go there if you haven't had to face death it's it, that's right like i think that's the point i'm getting at it's like death is inevitable for all of us in our current really basic understanding of human consciousness right like we're a big meat suit and eventually the meat suit stops working right and then and then okay and then what happens and and no one beyond you know you know um um no one beyond kind of organized religion has has created any theories that really help us to understand that but now there seems to be like a few people studying it writing books about it taking it you know trying to take it mainstream there's people like bob and his group and and people like yourself who have suffered you know loss and then have searched for answers and searched for connection but again you've been highly motivated right but i think the thing i'm trying to say is like all of us should be highly motivated because we all die and all of our family members die in our current understanding of what death is so if we started studying this stuff collectively like from our youth by the time we were 20 30 40 
wouldn't we be in a way better position to deal with the death of our family members and that whole grief and understanding? Like, wouldn't it, I mean, wouldn't, isn't there like a holistic lesson that we can learn about like how not to let, how not to just fly off the rails when our parents die, which happens to all of us at some stage. Right. And it, and it, and it's destructive and it, it takes a lot out of us and, you know, can set us back in, in, in our, in our own personal progression. But if we all learned that actually they don't die and that their consciousness exists somewhere else and that somehow we were taught the tools at a young age of how to tap into that, wouldn't that whole passing experience be just that will all the stress and negativity around it be alleviated? I, I, a hundred percent agree with you. I think this should be taught to us all since a young age, and it's part of it. I mean, you're still gonna grieve. That was actually a misconception I had. I thought I would get to a point of evidence, and it would be so strong I wouldn't grieve anymore. That unfortunately is not true, but it's a lot better. Mm. And I also think, along with grief and being able to cope with death and our own mortality, so much better. It just adds a certain like wisdom and perspective and kind of kindness you know I feel like when there's obviously exceptions but when people really delve into this it's kind of about getting in touch with like your humanity and yourself and it does seem to bring out like more of a kind approach to Mm -hmm. does that make the world a better place if people are kinder I think it would I'm sure there's some (laughs) There's probably some people out there who would disagree. Like, uh, so one of my big things on this podcast and that I talk about a lot um, is is I hate fear mongers, right? So the, the government does this, you know, militaries do this, politicians do this, everyone tries to force us, companies do this, pharmaceutical companies do this, everyone does this. Like, everyone sells us stuff based on fear. And I I totally reject anything that's sold to me on fear, right? But the biggest fear that we're taught to avoid is death or to try to avoid, right? And you think about the entire economy that is built up around avoiding death or dealing with death in a traditional way and not a more um, enlightened way, for example, like the one that you're describing, you know, where we're more in touch with our ourselves and understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, that... Uh, that the, the the spirits or the consciousness of our loved ones can exist in in another form some way like <clears throat> what like can you imagine like and I'm still stuck on this from like 30 minutes ago can you imagine if just like 8 billion people weren't afraid anymore yeah <clears throat> i'm trying to think about that because and i'm curious if you disagree with me on this i think there's a bit of fear that's good and i mean it was the fear that gave us the adrenaline you know thousands of years ago to run away from tigers otherwise you'd be like that you know and we wouldn't have a species you know you'd be like i don't feel like running so what the tiger will eat me i'll come back you know it prevents us you know from being like you know what i'd rather sleep an extra 30 minutes and you know then i'll drive 120 miles an hour to get to work because you know worst that's gonna happen is i'll die you know no one wants to go to the doctor you know like it's a, it's a pain, you know, you do it because you don't want to die. So what is the balance? Because there's something about an aspect of fear that I think is positive and then that applied often at times in a way or maybe twisted or, you know, I haven't given this enough thought to really have this put together. I'm just thinking this now. But wh- when does it go from being positive to destructive? Because having absolutely no fear... Oh, is that yours? It's okay. We love we love having some alarms go off from time to time. I'm glad you're here on time. Responsible. I don't know why it's going off. I think I accidentally set my alarm from this morning as I like re hit snooze from um from the morning. Let me make sure it's fully off so it doesn't. Right? No problem at all. It's all good. No worries. Just glad you don't have to run somewhere. I just had to apparently disrupt your podcast a little. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, you're right. Because um, if we live in a society where no one fears anything, then that's also pretty destructive because then people just behave really shitty, right? Yeah. yeah. So that fear of death causes us to 
treat people maybe a little nicer or behave a little nicer um, so that we can prolong our own life and maybe also understand that taking someone else's life is also a pretty serious issue and that we shouldn't do that. And I guess if there was a, a wide understanding of the afterlife, maybe we would all treat each other a little less seriously. That would probably be pretty bad. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it'd be a balance too, you know, because there's the fear that makes us miserable. There's, as we were saying, sometimes the fear that markets things in really destructive ways that we don't need. And, you know, sometimes when you're anxious or scared, you don't, you don't think clearly, you know, I mean, yeah, fear causes a lot of damage, but then yeah, there needs to be balance. Like, yeah, I mean, it kicks in at good times sometimes too. I mean, if, if I'm being chased, I want that fear to kick in. So I jump up and run. Yeah. But then also have the in the back of your mind that if something does happen terribly here, that there's something else waiting for me somewhere else. Like, you know, maybe that would be like, okay, you know, what we have on this earth and these relationships that we've built, you know, from zero to where we are today are valuable and important and we don't want to lose them. Um, but it, but if they are lost or not lost, but if those relationships are changed in some way um, because consciousness evolves or moves into a different body or into a different medium or into a different dimension that that somehow you know it all keeps kind of moving forward you know i think this even goes past fear to something like agony like if you're given a terminal diagnosis think of the agony people go through with that what if there was a way of making peace with that you know if you were like well let me get the diagnosis and see if there's a treatment option. And even if I'm going to be really uncomfortable and it has a 70% possible like results, okay, I'll go through that. Mm -hmm. But if you're given like a 2% survival, I mean, are, are you just going to be in just dread and misery the way so many people are? But if you were just like, well, you know, probably there's a bit of a grieving just like there is when you're moving. Mm -hmm. you know? and moving to another stage of life if you could reduce and kind of transform that that would be that'd be really what i yep yeah because if you think like if you just think about like the human condition today like we've all just come through covid uh there's two pretty significant wars that american the american government is helping out with in various parts of the world we're all kind of involved in that like i just feel like we all live in some version of like fear and anxiety all the time and you and you think about like you know that fuels the fast food industry that fuels the pharmaceutical industry that fuels the the you know the the psychology industry the therapeutic industry like all these people who are who can't deal with the day-to-day -day chaos of life but if there was some silver lining if there was some gold at the end of the rainbow like or some kind of understanding that that it doesn't all just stop you know, that could alleviate so much pain while we're still alive. I think so, too. Yeah. I think so, too. Yeah. And, you know, it could kind of end some time and improve some. Like, I mean, hopefully I don't see one single good thing about war. I don't see good things about fast food. You know, the way for me, just the way the factory farmed animals are yeah. treated is something I really care about. And pharmaceuticals I see as... You know, it, you can find the best of it and then the worst. Like, you look at what was done with the Sacklers and the opioids. I mean, you know, I mean, that probably comes from a type of type of fear, need, you know, the, this level of greed that you're willing to, you know, get these, destroy these people's lives for money when you already have more than enough money. I mean, it's just... There's no such thing in America. That's the problem, isn't it? So, I mean, how did your... So, how did your education help your grief so your father passed in 2015 you, yeah. you mentioned you were quite devastated you had a lot of grief like and then you just started reading you started google searching you started to really get into this so so tell me like three years later like where was your head at after you know losing your father in 2015 and having all these questions no answers to then meeting Bob and the forever family people and then moving through your grief and moving through, like how did education kind of change the way you saw your grief? Oh my God, it changed everything in multiple facets. First of all, this is the most 
fascinating scientific evidence and for me i guess curiosity is something that when life's feeling really unbearable to have curiosity to be engaged with is just it's a motivating factor it's like gives life a meaning when a lot of it was feeling pretty meaningless i mean it's take away even the grief factor that is so fascinating i it's almost like if you woke up you know, almost like a childhood fantasy. Saw a key in your room that you were like, what does that lead to? Find like a mystery door and you walk in and it's a room filled with colors you'd never seen before. I mean, it's just like, the fuck, you know, or getting to go to another planet and meet other species. This It's just the most scientifically fascinating thing I think I could ever have access to. That's number one. And that, that gave an excitement to it. Life again. Um, number two, I really felt it's almost definite, very highly probable that my dad's still with me and that I'll see him going from thinking he had just been wiped out. That's it. No more to thinking he's with me in a different form. It's profoundly healing. I'll get to see him again. I still have really bad grief waves and days I miss him a lot. And I've had other losses since then, such as Fran of Forever Family. That was really devastating to me. We we're incredibly close, mm. but you know, it's very different than the pain of thinking this person just suffered, passed away, and that was it, and you're never going to see them again. So it's it takes off a brutality, and there's something to look forward to permanently instead of for this short period of time. It takes away an anxiety of my own life. I feel less pressure to rush, rush, rush. I'm still very ambitious. I still care about accomplishing everything I want, but this, I guess you brought fear, the fear attached to it, the anxiety of I've got to do this, I've got to do this. It's, it's subsided some. Um, it's, I, and then also through all this, I just met amazing people. I met such a warm community that just added to the people in my life. I mean, a lot of these people have grown to be very dear friends and people I care about. And mm -hmm. that's another addition. Yeah, I mean, it just, it just, again, it just seems like the world would benefit so much by taking away this uncertainty or this misunderstanding of death that could alleviate so much depression, grief, anxiety, fear. Like, because we all, because we all live with it every day, right? In various ways, shapes, and forms. And can you imagine, like, what that would feel like if that weight was just off of our shoulders? I mean, I'm feeling it in myself. Either. So. I'm still not 100% convinced, but going from zero to like 95% convinced is transformative. Maybe even like 97 at this point. Yeah. And I think I, it does make me wonder how much of our horrible behavior, I mean, from someone who's just cranky, which you can't call horrible, but it doesn't feel very good when someone's rude to you, to you're saying wars. How much is, like, when people are, feel pain, they don't treat others well, how much of our mistreatment is, you know, unconsciously just the pain we carry with us over grief? I'm sure it's other things, too, and it's also individual, but it, it's a huge, huge sadness and trauma and ache and loneliness. And, you know, for a lot of sort of that dark feeling of, well, the unfairness if someone loses someone young and then... It, it, I think it changes. From my perspective, it changes everything. Mm. And then, you know, I think something I haven't mentioned is religious people, just because that's not really where I came from or on my spectrum. But I have had a few people who'd been religious prior, you know, prior in their lives, reach out and just say a lot of the terror religion gave them, like the, the thought of hell. That's not something I can personally really relate to. But if I really step back and think, what would that mean to actually think there was a possibility if I did some things wrong, I would spend eternity, I mean, not even a trillion years, eternity, suffering. It's batshit crazy. It's insane. Yeah. And there are people who really believe that. And how terrifying would that be to truly believe? Well, so I studied political philosophy and like world religions and university and stuff like that, right? So, no, it's depressing. It's unbelievably depressing. Well, no, because it's just, it's all about, it's all about controlling people through fear. So like, you know, uh, follow the Ten Commandments or you spend an eternity in hell. There's no, there's no middle ground, right? 
And then that, of course, makes everyone afraid of doing bad things. And then you keep people in line and you now have a society of people that you can manage and control. And then you can build the Colosseum and you can expand the Roman Empire and you can create laws and money and, and develop a society, right? Once everyone is afraid of something, then you can control them. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And then, and it's not even like it stops them from doing bad things. Like, I mean, I hate the idea of having people think there's a hell, but yeah, don't kill people. That's a pretty good thing to tell people not to do, but also people are being told to do things that are not bad, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, some of the stuff, the laws, like, that people who believe in this religion want to impose on everyone else, including people who aren't of their religion, you know, they want to impose laws on women, they want to prevent gay people from getting married, I mean, and I think there's you know, it, it's easy for me to be furious about that. And at times I am. But then if you talk to certain people, it's like they're probably good people who are absolutely terrified that like ever, that anyone who doesn't follow their agenda will be burning in hell. And maybe they feel about saving people from that the way I do about like animals in factory farms or hostages or, you know, people who are being tortured. I mean, I feel horrible. I would do almost anything to save people from and or other beings do from like these brutal conditions and you know and, and i think that's how a lot of people who've had a certain religion and woes upon them actually feel as well as the terror yeah how I, I just can't imagine it it it, it feels so silly uh, this sounds so rude because i know people really believe this but i mean to me sitting here it sounds silly but it's really not when you really think about it it's really yeah, I mean, for sure. So, like, I grew up, like, I lived in China for 18 years, and there you've got, you know, um, you know, there you've got a Buddhist population, you've got, uh, you've got um, a Taoist population, you know, in Tibet, you've got Tibetan Buddhism, and then, oh, God, you go to India, you've got, you know, Muslims, Hin Hindu, uh, Buddhists, uh, the, you know, uh, just so many people, and, and uh, again, they're just all trying to kind of influence some control over that, and when you when you really drill down to all of it, it's, it's, it's the fear of death. Like, and, and it's really only like in my mind, in my kind of understanding, it's really only, um, the Buddhists that really kind of really let go and don't really fear death and believe in like reincarnation. But, but everyone else is somehow afraid of death or somehow has certain things you need to do to avoid you know, a bad death or, or, or eternity in hell or something like that. And, and I just feel like, can you imagine if we were all just one day woke up and decided to believe in science-based theory? And then of course, and then of course, what if we could all come to some consensus about higher consciousness and, and the afterlife? Like, wouldn't that be amazing? If the, I'm trying to have a solid picture of what that would be like. I think it would be absolutely amazing. It just feels like people would just have so much more kind of playful approach to life and less like burdened and less weighed down. And I, I think we would enjoy each other and ourselves a lot more. Mm, sounds kind of idealistic. It does. But is it human nature when we find something else to then? Yeah. You yeah, no, it's it's crazy because, you know, like also too, like if you have healthy parents who are in their 70s or 80s, all they're doing is preparing to die. Like it sounds crazy, but like if you if you're in your 40s like I am now and you have parents that are in their 70s or 80s, like they're constantly just preparing themselves like, OK, I have a will. OK, you know, you know, this goes to you. This goes to you. This goes to you. What happens if I die here? OK, I want to be cremated. I want to be buried here. Like it almost like they spend their last like 10 years of their life worried about their eventual demise instead of living those last 10 years. Like, oh, that sounds, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you might, that's, that's horrible. Because I mean, I think, I think the way you kind of described it is your father was taken through an accident. No, he had, oh. he had me later in life. So he was older. I was pretty young and he had a stroke that was unexpected though. I mean, we, I knew he was older, but I wasn't expecting the diet and he had a stroke and it was pretty instant and it seemed like it was a mild stroke. So I wasn't too worried. And we went to visit him in the hospital and he was completely incoherent, never recovered, but you'd have like a few 
hours of work coherency, but he was he passed within three months of that. So it was semi instant. You know, he physically was there, but it was you know after the stroke he wasn't there. Yeah, that must have been incredibly hard to deal with. It was it was awful. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's such a weird paradox because it was absolutely absolutely devastating and led to the best thing in my life you know yeah so far yeah it's it's funny because like with every truly negative thing that happens in our lives like the passing of a loved one like it can lead us down a totally different path that we would have never chosen and we can we could have we that can lead us you know to finding a whole nother you know area of familiarity and comfort and education understanding that alleviates our own fears of what just happened exactly yeah that plus the people who came in my life like i just i love these people so much of some of the ones i've gotten really close with i can't imagine not having them and then the purpose i feel writing my book and podcasts and the people who reach out to me and i mean it means so much it feels like it's all so much fun like writing the books i've written and the podcast conversations i host they're so much fun and the people i've met and yeah the the alleviation of an existential dread of death that I did not know how much it was weighing me down. It's just I'd never had a comparison. Mm -hmm. No, I can feel it now. Like, you're you're a light person. Thank you. But it's only because I think you've come to some great realization or understanding. Yeah, you know, I think it's always been my personality to enjoy life. And, I mean, I've dealt with other, like, shit in my life, you know, that I'm probably going to be like talking about more but under a totally different brand just like it's like like kind of stuff about like prep school trauma it's it's, it's a whole other podcast but there's like these very high pressure prep schools and I I've been listening to podcasts that they cause trauma and I relate to that too so it's like I think interestingly there's always been which maybe sounds very ungrateful or shallow but you know it, it'd be a very long conversation to go into but I think some of the like dark pressures of certain types of education are very toxic for people and so I think because of that weight I had like a dedication to like enjoy every minute I could when I could mm -hmm. and appreciate that and then you know when hit with like the pommel thing of grief it was like I mean I felt like I would never enjoy life again and then I think I'm maybe yeah I'm probably even lighter than than I was before overall how do you think to, how do you think 2024 you would handle what happened to you in 2015 what happened to you and your father like what tools do you have now that you think would would kind of lessen the depth of that dark hole that you went through in 2015 I... is it just having the community around you of people like do you think that's part of it or do you think like you've learned how to deal with the grief based on your understanding and education around higher consciousness? I don't think this is a one-part answer. I think, first of all, I would still be devastated. I would still be in pain. There is no way around grief. Unfortunately, I really was dedicated to the thought early on that I would get a level of evidence and not feel grief again. But I had that evidence, and when Fran passed, I was shattered i still miss her with all my heart i still get grief waves about her i still get grief waves about my dad that is just part of being human mediums grieve and they can talk to ones on the other side you know it's similar to like if my dad was like you know what i love you and i want to go move to this private island and there's no cell phone communication or wi-fi and you know we're not going to talk for like 30 years at all and but I'll be healthy, but we'll have zero communication. Like, I would be devastated. I'd cry. I'd miss him. So it's a little more like that, which is significantly better than, you know, at least intellectually. I think physiologically you're just going to feel the grief. But I, I, that is still significantly better than if it's like, oh, your dad is wiped away and you're never seeing him again whatsoever. And he's never going to get the experience of enjoying life again. So... Yeah, so I do want to acknowledge that there is just no way around grief. However, again, the, that thought that I will get to see him again, there's a hope attached to it that wasn't there before. There were these wonderful people now around me. Like, I think I have a better support system, 
you know, especially around this topic where so many really are experts. And I feel like I would have access to communicate with him. And then very practical advice that I would give. Um, there's part of this afterlife research and hospice nurses talk about this frequently as well, interestingly. It's called deathbed visions. And often when people are close to dying, they start seeing their loved ones who've passed away. And there's research where this has actually been verified, where they'll start seeing someone that they hadn't even known had died. And, you know, I mean, I could go into a lot of studies how it's verified, but essentially there's a lot of reasons to think this is real communication with the other side, not mental hallucinations. My dad was having that. He was seeing his mother. He was seeing, I, I believe, his brother. That He was seeing a few loved ones. And instead of really appreciating the beauty of that and the science of it, I panicked and was screaming. I was like crying to my mom. I was like, he's hallucinating. We've got to get the psychiatrist in. And I couldn't face this was the process of dying. I could only accept we had to get his brain healed and get him back. And I think there was this whole process that I could have been a part of with him and sort of that twilight of between this world and that, that maybe would have been a really fair, you know, I don't want to say happy. I mean, grief is grief, but it would have been a profound experience if I could have experienced that with him like participated in his transition with a little bit more knowledge. Oh, yeah. 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 I see that. I see that. I, I'm, I'm always wondering, like, you know, um, I don't mean to make a light of any of our topic today, but, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, like when, when people wear those like VR glasses and they have like the whole helmets on and stuff, I'm always thinking like at some stage we're going to tap into these electrons or these magnetic fields or whatever is around us and have a chance to like, penetrate these other dimensions that exist all around us that we can't see right and i was always thinking like wouldn't it be cool if in 20 years from now or something someone created like a vr headset but allowed us to like go into different dimensions and talk to our loved ones that are still with us so like you could sit down and like have a whiskey with your dad that was something i always do with my dad he's still alive thank god but but you know like for people who have lost their loved ones and if they you know used to have a glass of wine in the evening with their parents and that was something you could do you could just put on the headset and and it not and it wouldn't be AI and it wouldn't be virtual. It would actually be them, and it would be like some way of tapping into whatever the mediums can do, but then commercializing it for the rest of us. Commercializing it and having some way that the way they're able to press into medium service systems to give them information, they could do that with a VR set mm -hmm. and present themselves there. That would be that'd be the biggest game changer if they could do that. That I would have, I can't think of anything better. It'd be cool, right? Yeah, yeah please, someone, anyone listening who could do that. Yeah. Because I think like, and also too, like, you know, like this is a whole, this is a whole level of the human experience that we know nothing about. Like, do you think of the educational value of being able to talk to people who have passed on to another dimension or another life? Like, just, and you think about like, today there's only 8 billion people on the planet, but there's more than 8 billion people who have died over hundreds of thousands of years, right? Like, can you, th can you imagine, like, having access to all that brain power? So much intelligence. You could talk to everyone from, like, Socrates to your great-grandmother. Yeah. You know? Be epic. Yeah. It'd be epic. Another kind of amazing thing that I, I, the ethics of this are really questionable until the technology would have to be unbelievable. But you've heard of near-death experiences? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, if they got the technology where they could, you know, we could safely pass away, like, you know, in, in some preserved, I don't know what the technology would be, and then they could resuscitate us, and you could have us dead for, like, 24 hours and bring us back. Yeah. There was a movie about that. Yeah, did you ever see it? It's called Flatliners. It was with Kiefer Sutherland and I believe um, oh, one or two other really famous actors. But it was it was like late 80s or early 90s and there was a bunch of like physics students and they would kill themselves and then resuscitate to see what they would see on the other side. And then, But they started coming back with like some demons and stuff and then they turned into like a Hollywood film. Um, but the pre but the premise was very co quite, quite kind of, uh, it had good intentions, let's say. I'll have to see that. Yeah. That sounds, yeah. I mean, so that theory, but not bringing back demons. <laughs> yeah, no, it would be, it'd be epic if we could somehow, like, 
reach that consciousness in short bursts and like educate ourselves somehow. Like, I mean, the stories our loved ones could tell us would be unbelievable. Like, I mean, think of that, how much happier life would be. It's like, you know, if you're living in another town than your parents, you can plan to go meet them for like a few days for a coffee next week, you know, or, you know, get on a, depending if you're on a plane, you know, and it would just be like that. You could be like, oh, I'm going to go in my device and have, if you said, I guess you have whiskey with your dad, have a coffee, just go in and be like, oh, hey, can you meet me tomorrow at this time? You'd probably have to schedule it out. I'm going to just pop in whenever. Who knows? I can't say how I know it would work. Yeah. And you could be like, I'm struggling with this, you know, grandma, what do you think? Mm. Or, you know. I wonder if like organized religion are wholesale like blocking the further research of this topic. Do you think that's what's going on? Do you think that's a limit to why this remarkable research, like even scientists who've worked with Dr. Stephen Hawking have done some research on this and people don't know it. Do you think that? Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like I feel like uh, there's certain knowledge about who we are, where we're from, who we communicate with, uh, how we feel things, how we how we access memories. You know, I believe there's evidence to all this that people definitely don't want to get out because it would destabilize the current nice warm cozy kind of society that we've built for ourselves today assuming you think that what we have today is like a great thing which i necess- i don't really think it's that great but you know we could do things a lot better <clears throat> and i think having understanding of higher consciousness having understanding of reincarnation having an understanding of what happens when we die what happens to spirits what happens to these electrons that leave our body like they don't just disappear right and and i just feel like like ignoring that for this like version of heaven and hell is just it's the last stupid thing that we have to get off the plate like i just feel like like there we've carried a lot of things with us we've carried a lot of baggage this is probably going to piss off a lot of people like we've carried so much baggage for the last two or three thousand years of things that our ancestors did and it's and because it created a stable society it allowed us to progress intellectually scientifically um you know but at some stage someone's got to like redefine these things that we took for granted 3000 years ago that our science has now elevated us to a position that we can understand better and we're not doing it wholesale because i think the powers that be just don't want to dis- just don't want to destabilize a good thing like they don't want to rock the boat I'm fascinated to learn more about your thoughts on that. I, I wish I was interviewing you now. And well, it's not a con- it's not a conspiracy theory when you think about like how governments try to control people, and you know, and and part of that is for our own good. Like, you know, if we don't have police, we'll all steal from each other. You know, like we'll all treat each other poorly. I actually do believe like the baseline human behavior is quite animalistic and quite brutal. Like society, society keeps us treating each other nicely and but but at the at the other side of that the the cost of that shouldn't be not knowing what happens to us when we die and having that used against us to behave i feel there's some i feel there's 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 some issues there like there's some legitimate because because again like how great would the world be if you could get rid of this grief and get rid of this fear and get rid of this anxiety and get rid of this horrible sense of loss that the people who are in our lives are then gone forever, ever. And, and, you know, obviously the physical loss, like you described, was intense and that grief is impossible to get rid of. But you'd have to think like if you understood more or there was a posi- or you were in a position to communicate with that lost family member, that that would significantly help your grief and allow you to move on in a much healthier way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I think with what I know now if i knew it when my dad was passing again i i feel all very strongly in saying there's no way around grief because i think our society minimizes grief and has no patience with it and i want grieving people to be patient with themselves i want society to be patient with grieving people and not just be like there's very much even if it's not sort of worded like this it's a very much get over it get over it like oh you can be really sad for a week and then come on get over it this is boring and i just think that's horrible and destructive so i it's very important to me to acknowledge that grief is a process. Grief is painful, but it doesn't have to be hopeless. 
you know, and I think it would have been very different for me if it wasn't hopeless when I was going through it. Mm -hmm. And that community that you found, you know, around the Forever Family Foundation and Bob and things like that, that that helped educate you in a way that made you feel like it was no longer hopeless. Oh, my God, completely. I mean, partially them. Uh, they're the ones I got to know personally as people. So that was where the deep, like, friendship and some almost like family um, have come in, the incredible warmth. But it was all the research. I and mean, it was the research of the Winbridge Institute with Dr. Julie Beischel and Mark Bakutzi, who conduct up to quintuple blinded studies on psychic mediums. It's people I've never met that just have such credibility, like, um, Sir Sir Roger Penrose and Dr. Stuart Hameroff. This is fascinating. So they have won Nobel Prizes. They've worked with Stephen, Dr. Stephen Hawking. And they had a theory, and I wish I was smart enough to properly explain this, so people are going to have to settle with my ability to explain this Stephen Hawking-level scientist theory. But essentially, it's that our brain has microtubules. That was their theory. And it's in a way where they create consciousness through quantum tunneling and and that sort of explains how consciousness works within our brain and through that they stated that it seems possible that consciousness could then be downloaded and hosted outside of a brain now very recently a paper was published in i believe it was like neuroscience magazine but it was one that does not talk about like afterlife stuff at all it's very traditional neuroscience and they verified the first part of their theory that microtubules seem to be what creates consciousness in our brain. And it ties into a way of how anesthesia works. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, these are some places they're saying to at least verify for part of their theory. And if the second part of their theory is that, you know, explains possible way that our consciousness can be non-physical. I mean, that's huge. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you... Like, that's just so huge having people like that. And that's been incredibly helpful because it gives it such credibility. And so it's kind of like, I can't say it's one thing. It's when it all starts to come together. And then say after Forever Family, I've met a few other people that I've developed warm friendships with. Um, I've attended the IONS conference twice now, which is International Association for Near-Death Studies. And I've made some friends there. And it's it's a very warm community, which makes me think of what you said about that it's it's an exceptionally warm group of people. So why keep them down? Why here's another question. You've got three billionaires all spending shit tons of money trying to go to space, and you have no billionaires trying to understand death and higher consciousness. The second person who said this to me too. No, it's ridiculous. I think I I think I even mentioned it to Bob and Marta when I was talking to them, right? Like, like when you think about, um, like, when is, like, imagine someone like Warren Buffett, a historical, you know, amazing investor, maybe the best we've ever had, you know, he's sitting on hundreds of billions of dollars of cash. What if he was just going to pass on, he's like 90 something now, what if he just dedicated his entire fortune, not to vaccines, not to polio, not to ending starvation in Africa, all very important issues, by the way. Not to going to space, also a very important issue. But we already have people doing that. What if you just, just what if you just donated two hundred billion dollars to figuring out what the hell happens to us after we die for real? I think that would be amazing, and I kind of agree with you. I do want to also. I think you said the same thing. Like the other things, like medicine and space exploration, are all very important. But I think this should be equal. To that, I mean, it should be getting equal funding. It should be part of the same group of where the billions are going, and possibly trillions. I mean, we might be having our first trillionaire, which is I have opinions on. You know, I'm. It's it's creepy to have trillionaires, but but at the, at the same time, like at the same time, like maybe there's no business case for helping us understand what happens after we die. But you think of the pain and the grief and the anxiety and the fear that you could alleviate globally by doing like some really well-funded, because I know I, I can absolutely tell it. all these researchers that you've talked to, all these people publishing books, they are all starving for capital to keep their research going. And the reason is, is that people out there are not interested in funding this, this section of neurological research. And it, and I just don't know why. 
I don't either. I am so, I, I, you seem to have more thoughts of it than I do. I am just here up against the wall baffled as to why. Yeah. I mean, if I had billions of dollars, this, that's probably where a large portion of my money would go. I would do some other things too, some of what you mentioned before, but this would be one of the fundamental things and all of them are struggling. I don't think there's a single one that isn't and I, I can't begin to understand. And people who you think are at the forefront of their science and their research shouldn't be this cash starved. And you know what? Apparently I've heard that there are some kind of famous scientists who would never admit it, but they've done little bits of exploration into this and they say they can't go any further or they'd lose all their funding. So not only are these people not getting much funding, it, funding is actively being taken away and blocked from this kind of research. Doesn't surprise me yeah. at all. And I'm the least conspiracy theory person ever. But so, like, just so people know where that's coming from, I'm not one of those people who, yeah, I tend to be probably more so than you trusting of, well, it depends which government, but, yeah. you know. So. Well, if you want to, if you want to have a really successful research division, um, you know, you should create a, your, you know, your own lab at a university, whichever one will allow you. And just say that uh, all of the afterlife uh, that you have done research on completely aligns with what the Bible says, and you will probably get massive checks coming through, and you'll have endless amounts of money to continue your research forever. Now, you want to go against religion, or against the Bible, or against some conservative pockets of this country, or whatever, okay. and you, you won't have it. You won't have to. You won't be able to pay the electricity bill. Yep. Is that too dark for today? It no, feels dark. No, it's. It's pretty much true. The only positive thing I'll add, but it's just not enough, was the founder of Xerox did exactly what you said, and not Bible related, but founded a division in a university, and that was the start of the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia, and he funded that, which is you know Dr. Stevenson, Dr. Tucker, so you know. But I think they're you know he was one person. And that was a long time ago, and they're struggling for money now, from what I understand. I mean, at least comparatively, compared to most other, I don't know, could you say you're going to do it, biblical studies, and that you're going to prove God, and then just not? I mean, can do the actual research? It doesn't matter what the research says. As long as you're in the news talking about it every day, then you're getting the sound bites, and that the people that are funding you are happy that that, yeah. you know, like, that's how sick a world we live in. It's true. It's true. Yeah. And I probably couldn't pull that off because I'd have to knock women's rights and a bunch of things that I think would really hurt our planet, you know, yeah. hurt humans. It's wild. It's uh, that's yeah, a little bit too much political economy, perhaps. But it's it's definitely how the world works. I, I don't think it's too much because I think it ties in. I think, yeah, as, as I was saying, I always wonder why is there not more research? But you saying that about po like playing in politics, that makes complete sense. I mean, politics is a huge aspect of what controls where our money goes well well climate change has been the real deciding factor so like in the last 30 years since i've been politically active since i went to university it's been almost 30 years now like fuck um but it's it's you see that more than anything else so if you have conservative groups funding scientists on the on the climate change then climate change is not really happening um, you know, a hundred years ago, we were in a cold cycle. Of course, now the world is warming up. This is all part of a bigger cycle, you know, a hundred year cycle, thousand year cycle, you know, climate change, greenhouse gases aren't doing anything. Right. And then if you have a scientific lab at another university that's funded by democratic donors, then it's like the world is melting. We're killing ourselves. We need wind. We need solar. We need electric cars. This has to happen today. Right. And, and, and nothing about those two science that are doing those two research are different except where their funding is coming from. I have to say, I think climate change is a pretty big issue and they have found microplastics and... Testicles. Yep. Bre breast milk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apparently I just heard on another podcast, like deep, deep sea, mm -hmm. fish in the deepest undiscovered areas of the sea. They discovered these new species and they're filled with microplastics. So, yeah, yeah I mean, I guess... Look where the interest is. I definitely think one of those sides. You want to protect the corporations and the plastic industries, and yeah, it's uh, it is crazy. But I really wish, like, but I feel like again, we're on the cusp of something. I feel like there's so many, so many people like you who have 
done the work and like been on a journey and people who are like Robert who who built out an entire foundation around it um, and other people who have had similar kind of experiences that like this can't not get bigger. I need to hear that. Thank you. That's so positive. I hope so. I mean, I think there's a lot of us dedicated to this. Mm. I think it's important. I mean, it's also just even if you take away a lot of what we were talking about, about making the world better and people happier, there's also something just about science. I mean, if this is how it works and this is the science, I'm a big believer in scientific truth and following the science and, you know, don't turn your back on the science. And if this is where it's pointing, let's go further with it. Would mm -hmm. many scientists hear me and think, oh my God, she's talking about the truth of science related to afterlife and completely dismiss me? Probably. And can I say I'm 100% sure? Maybe I'm wrong. But I, th this is actual data and results that being shown on a regular basis. And I just think it's really important to always follow where the data is going in a very pure, honest way. Yeah. No, you got to believe it. Hopefully the numbers don't lie. And hopefully the numbers don't get too political along the way. I know. I know. I know. Oh, it's scary. So, what, so you mentioned you've written a few books. What are the titles and what do they talk about? Okay, so I have two books mm -hmm. at this point. I'm gonna I'm working on a third. The the first is called WTF Just Happened, a Sciency Skeptic Investigates Grief, Healing, and Evidence of an Afterlife. Book two, WTF Just Happened. I, oh God, do please tell me I have my tagline exactly right. If not, it's, I should know my own tagline. This is horrifying. But a sciency skeptic can investigates even more evidence of an afterlife and fights for justice with her dead dog. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I got that one right. And that also led you to doing your podcast, WTF. What's that? What the fuck's happening right now? Yeah. So, so that's um, WTF just happened. All about oh. the afterlife. No woo. So. Okay. Yeah. And and what's it been podcasting and connecting with other people who have gone through similar experiences like you, or have other kind of ways of dealing with grief or understanding the afterlife? And it's wonderful. So. Bob and when Fran was here would always tease me because I would harass the mediums and any chance I could get my path to cross any scientist and I would basically like lock them in a corner and be like I have 800 questions for you I have 800 questions They're like okay like you know great first question okay second question okay you know we kind of have other things to do and I'm like no but one more so I'm like it's it's like a dream I get to sit they have to answer my questions for an hour to two hours, and I get to just ask the most fascinating questions of very smart people, and it's it's wonderful. And did I see it right that you've done more than 500 podcast episodes? I wish. No. No. Uh. I've done... Um, oh, okay. Well, that's amazing. Congratulations. So you're seeing into the future. <laughs> hopefully. No. Hopefully we'll all be at 500 someday soon. Yes. Yes. I'm working towards it. Mm. So where do you, I mean, where do you, where, sorry, little man, uh, where do you, where do you see yourself in the next kind of six months and moving forward with your mission of trying to educate people more about this space and trying to communicate with more people, writing your third book, you know, continuing with your podcast, you know, where do you, where do you see your work kind of progressing? Um, from working towards 500 podcast episodes, um, I mean, I just, I really try to share how I have taken all this time to gather this really mind-blowing evidence, and I try to share it in a very fun, relatable way. So I'm hoping to continue doing that, keeping sharing what keeps happening, what I keep experiencing, and trying to show that it really is normal. There's like, as I said, like, for example, my predictive dream. One of the things I love about this is not only is it absolutely giving you chills remarkable there's like a mundaneness to it that makes it very real you know the difference between you know having a past life memory of being you know a queen versus you know having hot chocolate at your grandma's yeah. at, at the end of the day and you know that's what life's really about the having hot chocolate not being a queen and that's what most of the past life memories really are about so you know i want to show like the wonderful mundaneness of it. I want to you know, help normalize this dialogue, help people not think it's either weird or fantastical or wishful thinking. And 
keep getting the books out there, keep talking to people, hopefully getting to meet some more people along the way. I host events called Science and Spirituality Salons where I give a talk on the science and a medium will give people readings, a science scientifically verified medium. Mm -hmm. So ways to get this word out there more in a relatable voice. That's nice, actually, because I feel like um, because you've had, you know, media training and communications training and you've written books in a podcast, like, it seems like you're a pretty good person to, like, bridge the gap between the sciencey folks that are bogged down with too much science jargon and then and then being able to communicate it kind of more effectively in layman's terms for people who just want to listen to a podcast or who are going through grief in their own right or are looking for answers as well and are looking for, like, something or someone to kind of hold on to before they go further on their journey and then get into the science, the heavier scientific information that's out there. Because I feel like, because that stuff is daunting to, to kind of dig into, like, um, and being able to listen to someone like yourself, who's, who's kind of bringing it down to like a, a level where we can kind of all understand is super important. And the more of you are there, the more, you know, we can change the way people might think about this. Ah, thank you so much. Yeah. I'm, partially doing that with the scientific voice and also the very spiritual voice or very religious voice that I think that it's very, depending who you are, but to a lot of people, it's very unbelievable. And, you know, if you're in grief and someone comes on and they're like, I know there's an afterlife. I saw an angel and God spoke to me. And then it's like someone like me would hear that. I was like, you know, oh my God, see, yeah, of course this is all nonsense. So showing yeah, both relatable in terms of some of the complicated science. And so we said it's like there's very valid, realistic mm -hmm. stuff happening too. And we're going to write a, we're going to co write a letter to Warren Buffett asking him to donate some of his billions uh, to this uh, field of study. Yes, we are. Yes. <laughs> that's, I think really that's the, the, the key. Like if someone wants to blow this, this topic, the scientific topic right out of the water. Someone just needs to lay down like $50 billion for a hundred year, you know, you know, grant or whatever, and just have the best minds in the country or the world working on this nonstop so that we can really, again, just alleviate that fear that we're all living under. It's just like a black cloud that follows us around all day long, every day. Yeah. And yeah, when you look at, I know you'd mentioned vaccines earlier, when the whole smartest minds got together, the whole world to create a vaccine for a novel disease, and we had it in less than a year? I mean, that's what people, and normally what they say, it takes 10, 20 years to get a vaccine, to get any medicine. Look what happens when the whole. Or Oppenheimer, you know, like he figured out how to build a nuclear weapon in what, like two or three years, you know, when when the resources were there, you know, beating the Russians and the, and the, and the Germans to building a nuclear weapon. Like whether, you know, it doesn't really matter if you believe in, military technology or vaccines or the afterlife but when huge amounts of resources are put in the right people's hands like things happen right and i feel like this scientific ecosystem needs way more knowledge and way more money to like really break it open and make it mainstream very completely mm. and valid and doing the actual tests and maybe you know maybe some of the stuff i've been saying or ginsburg said maybe we'll find we haven't been as accurate about certain things. And there's another approach, but it still leads towards afterlife. But like, you know, I mean, science, that's part of science. You're const it constantly evolves as you get more information. So, I mean, I guess what I mean to elaborate a little more on that is we'll probably get layers to this that we don't even, I don't even know how to talk about yet because we don't know what they are. Oh, we're barely at step one. Yeah. yeah different answers to some of the stuff we think we understand now and a different it's fascinating to even try to think about yeah with with the right amount of funding in 10 or 20 years everything we know now could be totally different right. but but better or, or 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 at least better understood yeah i do think whatever the answer is as we learn more i think it's going to be better than we can begin to imagine i i don't think, I mean, I can't 100% rule it out, but I don't think that the answer is going to be after all this research that when we die, that's it. I, I really don't think so. No, it can't be that simple. No. It's so, consciousness is so weird, really. I don't know, and 
multi-layered and complex and rich. You know, it can't, I just don't think brain cells alone can. It's funny, you know, like I've been, I've been watching just as a total aside, I've been watching, um, this, this, these history shows about like ancient civilizations and things like that. And, um, and it amazes me like 15,000 years ago, how much more connected to the earth and to the astronomy and to the stars that we were then than we are today. Like absolutely everything we did 15,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago was more connected and more harmonious with nature and the afterlife and astronomy and things like that. And it's like somehow we amassed this massive amount of knowledge. And then 3,000 years ago, we were like, oh, forget it, religion. And then, and then we just buried like a ton of de- like generations worth of knowledge. We just somehow ignored because someone wrote a book, you know? And that to me is, is insanity. Like how can you just throw away thousands of years of research and text and ways of life and just assume that this is going to be the, the best way forward now and ignoring all of that. Like in, in a lot of ways to me, that's what modern society has done. And I feel that's a huge disservice to, you know, the 15,000 years of humans that were evolving and learning how to live on this planet. What's an example of some of the stuff we've thrown away? Well, just, just the connection with the stars and nature and the equinoxes and the solstices and, and the understanding of harvesting and the understanding of the way the, you know, the earth rotates around the sun and in the connection with other stars, like, like these are things that everyone kind of respected and knew. And they even built entire towns and villages along, along the equinoxes of where the moon would come through on certain solstices and things like that. And nowadays you talk to your average 10 year old about a summer solstice or, you know, or, or an equinox or something like that. And they don't know shit like it. I know very little about that. Yeah, you know, yeah. And if you were to take that knowledge mm-hmm. and combine it with our technology, like the way we can see into deep space now, mm-hmm. like, and send robots to Mars. I mean, if you were to combine those two, well, I wonder what. Yeah. Or what if there was a way of like, or what if, you know, if it was properly funded, what if there was a way of, of somehow keeping consciousness around so that we can. Um, access that information and that history and that knowledge. Like, can you imagine, like, this would, you know, back, there was a famous movie a long time ago, like 2001 Space Odyssey, right? And they had this computer on board. His name was Hal, and he was supposed to be like AI. But imagine, like, you could go to into deep space and you could actually have the consciousness of other astronauts who had passed on before you, around you to keep you company, but also help you process everything. Like, there's there's something that we could tap into that's way bigger than all of us. That would be remarkable. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that would just be, So I, I, I don't even have the words, life-changing. I mean, but that sounds minimal compared to what that would really do. I mean, yeah, you could reach out to... Anything. Yeah, any. Anywhere. Yeah. That's wild, huh? Yeah, this whole, like, death when we die, like, there has to be so much more to this. Like... Like, I'm not a big conspiracy guy. I think there we all can agree, like, there's UFOs now. Like, I think, like, they came out with it, like, last year and was like, yeah, we've seen a ton of crazy shit. Yeah. And I think, like, this has to be the next shoe to drop. I think you you think the next shoe to drop is afterlife, you're saying, or details about the UFOs? Uh, no, that, I think, like, the details about the UFOs, like, already came out. I think, like, the next shoe to drop is going to be, like, actually, we don't all die and our consciousness exists and we need to figure out, like, how, why how to harness it, how to access it, you know, so that loved ones can still stay connected if they choose, um, or we can still tap into this vast knowledge of history and experiences that we've essentially just kind of thrown away. Yeah. Yeah, You know, yeah, that'd be amazing. And I mean, it's kind of unfortunate that gets blocked on so many different aspects from the materialist mindset of, and more my type of mindset and my culture of you know, science-minded where, oh, this is such nonsense, it's not worth it. And then this shocked me. I recently learned that religious people think mediums are talking to the devil. Mm -hmm. And any of that research is just tied to Satan, which, you know, I mean, that blocks it on a whole other level. And it's it's just being blocked from all around. And Mm. I mean, don't forget, we're only, what, like three or 400 years away 
from when we were burning women at the stakes because we thought they were witches because they might have been channeling me like they might have been mediums and maybe they had a cat and all of a sudden they're a witch and we, we have to burn women at the stake like right and these 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 people you know could have been in a position to help us further that knowledge and that science you know beyond and, and what do we do we just burn them all burn them yeah some mediums probably some were just independent women with opinions some were also dangerous apparently <laughs> <laughs> this is a problem with you know yeah women out of the kitchen so. Terrifying. Okay. So, in a in a perfect world, where would you see this this kind of um, this this ecosystem of the afterlife and understanding what happens to us after we die? Where would you like to see this kind of move forward in the next like year? Like, what would be like a huge breakthrough for you that would be like, yeah, now everyone really needs to take this seriously. Um. I think what I would love is a little bit along what you were saying about the serious research. If the researchers studying other stuff that if worded in a different way are considered too weird, like, hey, let's study all these other dimensions, that could sound weird, or you can call it string theory, you mm -hmm. know. And and if if it could be and basically what you said, if it could be taken really, really seriously and scientists such as, you know, they're Brian Greene, Dr. Lisa Randall, string theorists, you know, were asleep by this. And they were all be colleagues. And at the meetings where top scientists come, ones that are studying afterlife evidence would be there. And there would be technology and just really having it on equal ground of studying the biggest mysteries of the world in a serious, valid, respected, and highly funded way. So not so different than what you were saying. That's what I think would be the ideal break. And I also think, like, I've been shitting on organized religion and stuff like that, but there's a ton that we can also learn from organized religion, you know, because there's there was a lot of stuff that went on in the early days of organized religion before they tried to block out a lot of the things that we're talking about today, like about these fear-based things. Like, there might be real lessons that we can learn by doing a deep dive into them. So it's not like a complete write-off. But no, that, that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm fine with that about organized religion. I, to be honest, can't talk about it that much because I don't know much about it. But yeah, as, as long as they're not like imposing laws, I'm sure it's just there's a lot of misinterpretation of a great list. Yeah. Yeah. That's been that's been lost. But we need to get Warren Buffett's phone number. Yeah. You know, do you want to try to Google it? Let's see. Maybe we can hit him up on Instagram. He's a big Instagrammer. <laughs> Let's see. We'll send him a message and see what he says. So, um, so when is the, when is the new book coming out? The third book? That's not for a while. No. I don't know yet. Book two is pretty new and the audio book for book two should be coming out in a couple months. Right now, the paper book and ebook are ready and that just came out a few months ago. Okay. Yeah. That's wonderful. And, uh, and you and where can, where can people find the podcast? All of it. You, well, you can find the podcast on all podcast apps. And it's WTF Just Happened, all about the afterlife, no woo, podcast apps and YouTube. You can link to all of it on my website, which is WTFJustHappened.net. And you can also find me on social media. I'm pretty active on Instagram and TikTok. You can link to my handles through my website. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Is there anything else you want to talk to today or you feel good? I mean, that was a great conversation. I feel good. I mean, I do I? I could talk for another five hours. There is so much to this. So you do have a flight tonight. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Look, we can just go up here to this camera now and we can show everyone we're in the same room. And uh, it's wonderful to meet you. And uh, keep pursuing the science. And I hope, yeah, come back anytime and let's keep, keep the conversation going because I love this topic and I think there's way more to it than we're, we're, we're currently getting a chance to understand. So we got to keep uh, keep pushing the science and figuring out what really is going on. Yes, and thank you so much for using your platform to help get this word out. Of course. Thank you so much. Take care.